Well, we've been in the series, Pursuit, and I've got to say, personally, I found it a real blessing. And speaking to many of you, I know it's been a blessing as well as we've gone through A.W. Tozer's book together. And we arrive at the final chapter, um, which is really exciting, just in time for Easter. And uh, the, the, the chapter is entitled Sacrament of Living, um, which is an interesting title. It feels a bit ye olde, doesn't it, in terms of its language. And so I've renamed it for the purpose of today to a call to holiness, which essentially is the same thing. And we'll unpack that and look at why that's the case. But we're going to look at a call to holiness. And to do that, I'd like us to turn together to um, uh, the verse that we're going to be looking at today, which is found in 1 Corinthians uh, 10 Verses, verse 31, and it will be on the screen if you're at home watching this on any device, and in the room it will be on the screen behind me as well. Um, but let's read this together. This is Paul re- writing to the church in Corinth, and he says this, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And with that, I'm going to pray. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word brings life and it brings freedom. And your word, Lord, will accomplish that which it's set forth to do. And I pray this morning, Lord, that you would remove any distractions, any burdens that we are carrying. And Lord, you, would you help us by your spirit, not just to listen to your truth, but make a commitment to act upon your truth today, Lord. Lord God, this word is going to be a breakthrough for so many people. And I know, Lord, the enemy is going to try and derail many. Just come against that spirit of slumber in Jesus' name. Lord God, would you just help us, Lord, I pray in your name. Amen. All right, so how is holiness and this verse linked well, let's first understand what holiness is, because if I'm honest, I don't think we, f- we truly understand the word holiness, or we partly understand it. See, holiness simply means being set apart for God. Or another way to look at it is being dedicated to God. And the fruit of which, the fruit of being dedicated to God, being set apart for him, the fruit of that is moral purity. Or to put it another way, walk in like Jesus. But the thing about holiness is that it cannot be manufactured. What do I mean by that? You can't shortcut holiness and go straight to the moral outworking or fruit of it. And yet that is often how we see and judge holiness. For example, well, they must be really holy. Did you see what they did? Wow, they, he must be really holy. Did you hear what he said? Wow, I've met some really holy people. They have done some amazing good works. Now, that isn't the fullness of holiness. Because holiness isn't a works-based message. It, holiness isn't about performance. Holiness is a fruit-based, relationship-rooted invitation to a new way of living. I'm going to say that again. Holiness is a fruit-based, relationship-rooted invitation to a new way of living. Why? Because the root of holiness is a life, all of our lives, every part of our lives, rooted in and devoted to Christ. That's holiness. And out of that place, you see, we become more like Jesus and the works come. James says, you know, works are important because they're an evidence of our faith. It's not that our faith is based on works. It's that a fruit of our saving faith in Christ is the works. But you see, we think holiness is just the works. Hey, I know people more, quote, 
unquote, holier than me. Oh yeah, they do amazing works, but they don't know Jesus. It's not holiness. You know, John Wesley, who's heard of John Wesley? Founder of the Methodist movement, a great revivalist. Before he encountered Jesus, he was part, I think he went to Oxford or Cambridge, he was part of what was called the Holiness Club. And it was a works-based club, and they would have a diary, no word of a lie, and they would map out the holy work they would do. They would make sure they prayed a certain amount of times a day. They made sure they would uh, fast once a week. They made sure they'd visit the prisons. They'd make sure they would do this, that, and the other. And they, therefore, thought that if they were to do that, they would obtain holiness. Wrong. It's the other way around. Once you commit to living a life undivided and committed wholly to Christ, then the fruit comes. And I think one of the problems with the way we, we walk our Christian life is that we think holiness is about works and so we make ourselves do good works and yet, deep down, we live an undivided life. What did Paul say? Whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. How do you do all things for the glory of God? I mean, that was my next question. I would say the twin verse to this is Jesus' own words in Matthew twenty two thirty seven, And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is what it means to, be, to live a holy life. That's what it means to be set apart for God. That's what it means to be dedicated to God. It means that we love the Lord God with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our soul. Don't you think that pretty much covers everything? And you know, Paul here in the the letter to the Corinthians is like, listen guys, you want to get down to the basics of it. I'm talking about what you eat or drink, that very mundane thing that you share with your dogs and other animals, that very basic thing You can do that for God's glory. So if you can do that for God's glory, boy, you can do everything. And you see, what Tozer is doing as he ends this book on pursuing God is he's he's throwing down the challenge to say, if you want to pursue God, you've got to do it in an undivided manner. There can be no secular and sacred, so-called secular and sacred divide, which is what... uh, the message of this chapter is. Let me just read some other scriptures that were very, very common to us. What do I mean by that? The ones that we say very frequently. Romans 12.1, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does that mean? It's a call to holiness. Holy and acceptable to God. There it is, you see. Which is your spiritual worship. What about John 14, 15 to 24? I'm going to uh, look at this and put together different parts of this passage. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's what it means to be holy. It means about keeping God's commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Don't come to me and tell me you love God and break his rules. But I love God. I love Jesus so much, but I'll just do half of the stuff he tells me. I'm sorry, by Jesus' own words, you don't love him. Oh, Mark, you're really going for the jugular today. I just feel it, you know? I feel like at the end of this series, we're just going to get rid of all the niceties and just say it as it is. Are you all right with that? Yeah. You're going to still like me afterwards? It's fine if you don't, it's fine. What else? If anyone loves me, he will keep my words. What, you mean this? Yes, all of it. But I thought we could pick the bits we liked. Apparently not. Apparently this is all, listen, if you don't believe this is God's word, then, well, that's another conversation. But if you believe this is God's word, then you've got to believe that you've got to do all of it. Listen, if you've got your car manual, you don't go, oh, I believe the bit about putting petrol in, but my engine does not need oil. You can try it, and what's going to happen? Your engine's going to break. 
And we have lots of broken people because we look at the word and think, well, I'll pick that bit because I agree with it, but culture doesn't agree with that bit, so I'm not going to agree with that. And we wonder why we've got brokenness everywhere. <clears throat> oh, man. I did not know it was going to be one of these days. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. So I carry on. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So are you linking that, Jesus, with the fact that, wow, are you saying that you'll come to those, you'll make our home with us if we love you and keep your commands? That's what he's saying. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. So when we talk about pursuing God, it's got to be all in or nothing. I think that's the point Toes is trying to make. <clears throat> But here is where we have a massive disconnect in the outwalking of our faith. And let's take a step back for a moment and look at it from another angle. As Christians, we have some internal tensions. Let's be completely frank about this. Now, I'm not talking about the sinning and not sinning. That's an obvious one. I'm talking about other tensions like, do I carry on praying for something? Because if I carry on praying, does that mean I don't have faith for the first time I prayed? Anyone else think like that? I do. Do I hear God's voice or was that me? What about this one? If God heals, why isn't he healing now? These are some valid tensions that we feel, right, as Christians. And there's many more besides, isn't there? But this is what Toza says. One of the greatest hindrances to internal peace which the Christian encounters is the common habit of dividing our lives into two areas, the sacred and the secular. See, one area we believe our lives to be holy. We pray, that's holy. We come to church, that's holy. Uh, We read our Bible, that's holy. I'm being really good to someone at the moment. I'm clearly being holy. I'm giving my tithes, therefore I'm holy. And then we have our so-called unholy lives. Well, I'm walking the dog, that's not very holy really, let's be honest. Uh, I'm shouting at my kids, that's not very holy. Um, You know, I'm making my dinner, that's not holy. You see my point here? And we fall into this trap of saying, that stuff is really holy, and God loves that, and this stuff is really unholy. And we call it the sacred and secular divide. And the problem with this is, if we live like this, we will oftentimes feel like Jekyll and Hyde. Who has had that, you don't have to put your hands up. I have had that struggle before, feeling like a Jekyll and Hyde. I've had someone say to me, a long, long time ago, and you call yourself a Christian. And it was in that moment that by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes and go, you know what, I think they've got something there. Because I feel like I'm a Christian on a Sunday and on a Monday I'm not. Sunday's my holy day and Monday's my terrible day. But we're not called to live like this. It was never intended to be the case that we would look at our lives through the, the lenses of sacred and secular. Everything is sacred. And no better person to look at the model of this than Jesus. I'm going to quote Tozer again. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is our perfect example, and he knows no divided life. In the presence of his father, he lived on earth without strain. I don't want strain. From boy babyhood to his death on the cross, God accepted the offering of his total life and made no distinction between an act and another act. I do always the things that pleases him was Jesus' brief summary of his own life as he related to the Father. I do all things to please my Father. As he moved among men, he was poised and restful. That's true, isn't it? If you think about Jesus, he never rushed anywhere, but yet he did so much. Why? Because he was restful that he did all things for God. What pressure and suffering he endured grew out of his position as the world's sin bearer. They were never the result of moral uncertainty or spiritual maladjustment. I find this fascinating. It's true when you reflect, Jesus did not live a sacred and secular life, and yet he was fully human like we are. Fully human and yet fully God. And yet he didn't live a sacred, secular divide. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. 
It might sound like an impossible task. One which is suited maybe to monks and nuns. I bet they have it easy, don't they? Don't you think like that? I think sometimes I'm like, Lord, please, I just want to escape. I want to live in a monastery. It will be so much easier. I can just wake up praying and go to bed praying. I mean, I'm sure it's not that easy. But I wouldn't have to juggle this so-called secular and sacred divide that I somehow seem to have a tension with. And, you know, in case we don't think it's the everyday, I mean, goodness sake, eating and drinking. Now, I want to take a step back. Come with me into my time machine, back to Israel. And I want to try and look at this from another angle. I feel like part of the talk today is about taking a few different threads and trying to weave something that it makes sense to us. But let's go back to Israel when they were in Egypt. They were in slavery and in bondage. And we know that by the hand of Moses, by God's power, they came out of Egypt, correct? And in Egypt, they were surrounded by idolatry and other gods, weren't they? But the time came, they they came out, and they were heading for the land of promise. But there was a problem, Tozer points out. The problem was the very idea of holiness, that God is set apart, that they are called to live a life of holiness was lost on them. And so to correct this, God began at the bottom. And God wanted to teach Israel the difference between holy and unholy. And so what did God do? He localized himself in the cloud and fire first. That was a holy place. And later when the tabernacle was built, he dwelt in the holy of holies. And when he met Moses on the mountain, that was a holy place. There were holy days, holy vessels, holy garments. And conversely, there were days that were not. There were washings, there were sacrifices, there was offerings of many kinds. Now, what was the point of this? It was so that Israel learned that God is holy. It was that that he was teaching them. It wasn't the holiness of the place or the things, but the holiness of Jehovah was the lesson they had to learn. That he was set apart for them. That's what happened then. Then fast forward to the great day of of Jesus when he arrived. Immediately he began to say, you have heard it said by them of old, but I now say unto you. In other words, the Old Testament schooling had finished. God came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to abolish that, but there was now a new message. And when Christ died on the cross, what do we know that happened? The veil of the temple was torn in two, right? from top to bottom. So what's happening here? The Holy of Holies was opened up to everyone who would enter by faith. Why is this? Jesus said this in John 4, 23. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. No more did we need to go to the temple. No more did we need to go to the holy place. No more did we need to go to Jerusalem to worship the Father. No more was there a divide between the holy and the unholy because we are now made holy and set apart by God because of the shed blood of Jesus. The divide went. Do you see what's happening in the ark of redemption here? In that meta-narrative of this biblical story of rescue, The holy, unholy divide was there, but when Christ came, there was no more a divide because those who believe in the shed blood of Jesus are now made holy because we've been washed with that very blood. That is great news. That is why the so-called secular is sacred because we are made holy. Be holy for I am holy. We walk in that holiness. You have been made clean so that you can enter the very presence of God. There was now no more distinction between secular and sacred. All things were sacred. And then Paul went and built on this. And Tozer says, he took up the cry of liberty and declared all meat clean. And then he said, every day is holy. 
All places are sacred and every act is acceptable to God. Wow, this new covenant is amazing. The sacredness of times and places, Toza said, a half light necessary to the education of a race to point us to the need of Jesus now has passed away before the full sun of spiritual worship. That is what it means for us to worship the Father. It means that we can have an undivided life because we have been made holy by Christ's blood. But over time, do you know what happened? The church decided to go and add all the holy stuff back in. The natural legality of men's fallen hearts, and we looked at this last week with the burdens, that, that Greek word for burden was all those rules and regulations which are not of God. The church decided to pile it back on again. Certain places were chosen and marked as holy. Certain days were observed as more holy than others. The sacraments were installed. There was first two, then there was three, then four, until, and I quote Toza here, and I do so in a spirit of charity, the triumph of Romanism was they fixed it at seven. Why do you think there was a Protestant Reformation? Because we had lost that it was by Christ alone. It was all done on the cross. The church had added it all back in again. But hold on a minute, we've come out of Egypt. No. <laughs> it's that ph pharisaical spirit that has bundled in legalism. And it, all it does is propels that notion of sacred and secular. And I don't think the charismatic church has helped too much in some ways. <gasps> what? You can't say that. We're a charismatic church, I know. But the danger we have of the holy man of God at the front is that we make that really holy and we want to be like the man of God at the front of the church. And one of the things about Vineyard and many other parts of the charismatic movement, don't get me wrong, is everyone gets to play. It's not about a special holy stage and holy thing and holy man or woman. It's about that we are all made holy by Christ's sacrificial blood on the cross. And we can all walk in the gifts of the Spirit. And we are all anointed for such a time as this to declare the good news of Jesus. There is no more a secular and sacred divide, and yet there is something in our hearts, the fallen part of our hearts, that wishes to reinstall it because it's very comfortable for us. I can prove this. As soon as you walk in this building, you're not going to swear, are you? But it's easy to do at your house. Isn't that a fair point? You're unlikely to look at stuff on your mobile when you on your own in here, things you shouldn't, because when well, I'm in church. And yet somehow we think God doesn't exist at your home. You see, the sacred secular divide is something that we lean to because it gives us an excuse to have an undivided life. Because deep down, we want to justify our sin. And so the secular sacred divide allows us to do that. It's okay, this place isn't holy. It's okay, it's not Sunday, it's Tuesday. I hope you get the point. And I'm only explaining to you the things that I feel the Lord is saying to me and challenging me on. But if Paul is saying, even when you eat, that is holy, there's something that we're missing. And I think, to add another stream, another thread to this, we have a, 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 a problem. We squash together holy and valuable. Let me give you an example. We rightly think that leading someone to Christ is more valuable than having a glass of water. I think that's true. But that doesn't mean that leading someone to Christ is more holy than drinking a glass of water. That's the point here. All can be done for the glory and honor of God. Thank you, Lord, for this water. Bless you for the freedom that I have. That's just as holy as praying with someone to receive Christ. But you see, because we squash and we conflate valuable and holy, we create a divide in how we look at things. I wish I could work for the church. That's really valuable. No, what's, what's really valuable and holy is walking in the corner that God's placed on your life. But we think that the holy thing is to do the full-time ministry thing. That's not more holy. 
than go in and get in on the bus and go into your work or go in and stand in outside the school gates for your kids. That's just as holy. I'm going to end as I invite the band up with this statement from Toza. And I, I realize I've quoted a lot of Toza, but hey, we are being used in his book. And I feel like this is a summary of 10 weeks worth of teaching on pursuing God. And I feel like that this summary is the challenge that we need to answer deep in our hearts as to whether we're going to pursue God. Because if we can't sign up to this statement, then we're not ready to pursue God yet. Those who pursue God and his righteousness, who take seriously the command to love him above all else, is that you? Are those who are consumed with the things of God. They are eager to study God's word, eager to pray, eager to obey and honor God in all things and eager to share Jesus Christ with others. It is through these spiritual disciplines that the love for God grows and matures to the glory of God. Now, I'm not saying that any of that is easy because life is tough. I'm not saying we wake up with a skip in our step saying today's going to be an amazing day as I do all these things. What I'm saying is it's about a choice we make to say, Lord, I might not even feel like that every day, but I want to be like that every day. It's about saying, I recognize, Lord, that you have called me to offer my whole selves as a living sacrifice on the altar. I recognize, Lord, that you have said, Jesus, your own words were, pick up your cross and follow me. That means I need to die to the flesh and the, and the things that I want to do. Listen, I recognize this is a hard word, but it is through this word, and as we say yes to Jesus, that we walk in a new level of freedom and victory in our lives. So how do we respond to this? I want to go back to 2 Chronicles 7.14, which is a verse that I use near the start of this series. It says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek, and they seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. But it is through repentance as we confess our sins, as we get right with God and pursue His presence, that we experience Him and we pursue Him. I'd like us all to stand as I pray.